All right, we're continuing with our study of graph theory, and we're going to do uh, the opposite side of the coin from our meeting a week ago. Now, a week ago, we studied examples leading up to this result, which, which of course, I didn't prove, but I want you to know about it, and that is that you can have triangle-free graphs with large chromatic number. Actually, you can do much more. You can have graphs that don't contain any small cycles at all. And what's important about that is this notion of what it looks like to you locally. So imagine that in the sense of a distributed computing network, when you are looking locally, and you are looking out at the world that you're connected to, as far as your eye can see, it looks like a tree. You can't look out this way and see that eventually it comes back because you can't see far enough. Okay? Now, it does come back. There are cycles in the graph. If there are no cycles in a graph, what's the chromatic number? At most two, <laughs> if you you got to get have got to have an edge to get up to two, but if there are no cycles, then the chromatic number is very small. So in order for the chromatic number to be big, there have to be cycles. The question is, can you see them? Well, how far can you see? A mile? Two miles? Ten miles? What happens if the smallest cycle has girth a million miles? You'll never see it. Yeah, but, but those cycles can be there, and they can drive up the chromatic number. It takes quite a while. It takes a huge graph, very, very big graph. But eventually, you can get big chromatic number. So the theorem, proved by Erdős many years ago, is that you can have large girth and large chromatic number much stronger than the triangle-free graphs that we looked at in our actual lecture. Now, I encourage you to look over the explanations, because they're actually quite elementary, for the three constructions that we gave that showed there are triangle-free graphs. So at least you can get the girth up to four. And four is not forever, but it's something. Okay, but with a probabilistic method, you can get the girth to be anything you want. And once again, I want to say that, oh, I hope they're not going to chase us out. <laughs> let's, let's hope that was just a momentary beat. It goes off in skiles all the time. Every time there's a final exam, you know, we just might as well walk out on the, uh, anyway. So I mentioned to you last time, and this is something where, okay, the, the full depth of this goes beyond the level of math 3012. But all of you who are interested in applications of computer science and double E should know that in some sense this was the birthplace of what today we call the probabilistic method. And, and the idea of that one can have algorithms which are not deterministic. They are probabilistic. They used random methods. So your actual choice is not determined 100%. At various places, and sometimes quite often, you do things at random. And this is where it all started with this classic result of, of Erdős.